tithing has been a hot topic for a while. People always, people tend to talk about tithing um, in the sense of that we shouldn't tithe as Christians or that as Christians we should tithe. And we often give reasons why we often quote Malachi chapter three or we go directly to Malachi chapter three. Um, in addition to that, we also will kind of take Malachi chapter three out of context, uh, mainly because we're so focused on, you know, the tithing, the curse and the blessings that come with tithing. I did get a chance to listen to Creflo's entire message. Um, and if I'm being honest, I actually agree with most of what he said in his message. Shoot, shoot the messenger. <laughs> but I agree with him when it comes to correcting incorrect theology in the church. One of the main reasons why I started One Faith and I started making these videos um, is simply to highlight that. I wanted to correct a lot of these incorrect theologies that we've been passing around for years, for centuries. Um, and I wanted to do it in a way that is very um, constructive, but at the same time, it's educational and it helps the unbeliever, it helps even the believer to break free of those things that we have passed down generally that isn't biblical and is nowhere found in the Bible. Um, and I always talk about hot topics, I always talk about things uh, from that perspective as well, because I want to break free from that religious cycle, that religion aspect. I don't want to focus in on that too much. I want to focus in on what the Bible truly says and, and really hone in what the Lord truly is saying in his scriptures is, is very clear and is very blatant. But oftentimes we can convolute those messages or convolute the word of God with our own opinion, with our own feelings, with our own insight and intellect to that. It's not really biblical. It's just kind of, I don't say, I don't even want to say spiritual It's real fleshy is really just us trying to prove a point. And that's not what I want to be all about. I don't even, when I make my videos, it's not even about trying to prove a point or anything like that. It's really just showing what the word of the Lord says. And this is what we standing on. This is what I stand on. So uh, when it comes to that particular point in his, in his message, um, how the church has passed down ideologies, I agree with that. I'm with you on that. Um, the spirit of religion, breaking free from the spirit of religion. I'm with you on that as well. Like, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to front this message is this, this video is not about, uh, breaking down his entire message. I'm not even going to do that. Uh, and it's not even about, you know, trying to throw him under the bus. I think the church does uh, such an awesome job. <laughs> I think that the, I, I won't say the large church, but I will say, well, when you look at the body of Christ and you look at how we all kind of come together, um, when one, when one area of the body is messed up, we all are messed up. So I will say, yeah, I think the church, you know, does a great job in throwing people under the bus and cutting people off. Um, especially if we don't agree or we don't um, understand their ideology. I'm not even here to do that. You know, I, I want to encourage, you know, if I can, if, if he's listening, <laughs> I want to encourage, you know, to, to continue studying and continue getting this word because, you know, of course, when we come in off of, when we breaking off of these things that you have been taught all these years and you're really kind of deconstructing, but yet reconstructing and staying in the word of God, um, it's so easy to um, kind of drift off into your own kind of thing and not even really center back on what the word of God really says. Um, tithing is something that is found all throughout scripture. It's not even something that it, even if it's not mentioned in the New Testament as much or as blatant as it is in the old, it does not mean that we disregard what was in the Old Testament just because it's no longer found in the New Testament. There is a difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. But what you have to understand is what does that word covenant mean? What does the Old Covenant mean? What is the New Covenant? The Old Covenant is about the law. Um, what everything is that the law was all about um, and how that law was to keep us humans um, in subjection or to keep us um, from sinning or from falling. And even if we did sin, if we did, we had structures, rules and things in place as far as to atone for those um, sins under the Old Testament. That means that we had to sacrifice fat calves and we had to sacrifice all these different animals in order to atone for our sins. That was under the old covenant. But the reason why 
we don't have or we don't follow under the old covenant anymore is because when God created the old covenant, it was never a means to be our sense of atonement or our sense of salvation. You know, when when the old covenant was created, it was in response to the initial sin, the initial fall of Adam and Eve. That's when the old covenant came into place. But what we have to understand is God knew that Uh, mankind could never fully live up to the standard that is with the law under the old covenant. When you look at the old covenant, when you look at the Old Testament all throughout scripture, you see uh, from Genesis down to Malachi, how the people of God would consistently try to live up to the covenant, but they would consistently fail. And most of the time they would fail only because of their lack of reverence to God. Bible is clear. God is clear in his word where he says that he is a jealous God. You won't serve other gods or put other gods before him. And that is what we see consistently over scripture, over time, whether it's idols, whether it's um, money, power, possession, whatever it is, these things crippled the people of God and it caused them not to fully live up to the standard or the old covenant. It shows us exactly what is sin and it also shows us exactly um, how we could never measure up to this to the old covenant. We could never measure up to the law. No matter how hard we try, we can sacrifice as many, um, as I said earlier, we can sacrifice as many animals. We can give as much as we can. We can do whatever it can, whatever, whatever it takes to try to live up to the standard. We will never live up fully to the standard. We need a propitiation. We need, we need something to redeem us. And the only thing to redeem us from <laughs> from our sins to save us from our sins is a blameless, spotless lamb. Okay, follow me here. So when Jesus comes onto the scene, he's the only person who is able to live a blameless and spotless and sin free life. That's why when we see the new covenant comes in um, in Matthew 5 and 17, Jesus says, I'm here not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. It's because throughout old Testament scripture throughout the law, throughout the entire, from Genesis through Malachi, whether you want to look at whatever from Genesis through Malachi, Jesus is all up in there. But at the same time, all of Old Testament points to Jesus, period. It does not point to anything else. It all points to Jesus. Jesus is saying this old, the Old Testament, the old law, the old standard, it's all pointing to me, meaning that you could never live up, live up to, you could never live up to the standard of the law, but here I am. I can live up to the standard. And not only am I living up to the standard, but I'm living up to the standard on your behalf. And because I'm living up to the standard on your behalf, I am now your means to salvation. I'm now your means to heaven. That's why he says in John that no man comes to the father, but by me, he is the door. He is the one that can get us to the Father. He is the one that can get us to the throne. He is the only one who can present us spotless, who can present us blameless. That's scripture. That's Bible. That's Jesus. That's why we're under the new covenant of grace, because the new covenant is filled with righteousness, grace, mercy, love, peace, all of these things that we could not get if we were to still try to live up to the standard of the old covenant, the old covenant is never going away, but God, and, and this is another thing too, God never replaced the old covenant with the new. He just, he made a new covenant with us and told us to still follow the old law or still follow the law and still follow the things of the law, because this is how we know exactly what sin is. We know exactly what sin is based on the law. So let's break it. Let's break it down. There's something that I like to call, um, the two truths and a lie sermon. Uh, a lot of preachers do this. A lot of preachers will, will, will get up here and they'll give you a few truths to try to ease you in, to make you comfortable, to really um, help you to kind of relax your, your, your standard or relax your thought process and to really trust what they're saying. So they'll give you a few truths. They'll throw in a few jokes. They'll throw in a few things to make you feel like, okay, I can really trust this man or I can really trust this woman. I can really trust this person. But then by the time you, your, your trust level has came down and you have really opened up to receive what they, what they have to give you, then they will in turn stick you with the lie. They will stick you with whatever that their opinion or whatever their thought or whatever 
they believe or whatever they feel or whatever their interpretation of the scripture truly is. That is dangerous. And I want to point that out. And I call that the two truths and a lie because it's like when you're when you're deciphering um, through that process and you're trying to fully hear and fully understand what the word of the Lord is saying, you're going to you, you, you have to let's put it this way. When, when listening to a preacher who is doing these type of things, that two truths and a lie type of preaching, you have to know the Bible for yourself. It's only um, imperative that you know the word of God for yourself, because if you don't, then you will buy into the lie because you're listening and you hear the two truths. You say, OK, I agree. I'm with that. I, I'm with the one that I, I'm with. you. I'm, I'm there. Yes. Yes. That's good. Yes. You're preaching the truth. And then by the time they give you the lie, it kind of messes with your mind a little bit. But you always you already went back on to the fact that, OK, well, what he said earlier was good. And, and it come and, he, and you can and they can kind of subtly um, ease that in only because they know that they have now bought your your trust. They have your trust. They have your whole trust of your whole life, basically in the palm of their hand. They know that you're eating off of the platter that they're giving you. So this is why it's important that you have to know the word of God for yourself. You have to know the word of God for yourself. I, I advocate for this all for anyone. I advocate this for anyone. You need a study Bible. You need a Bible and you need to read it from Genesis to Revelation. You need to read it every year <laughs> and you need to make sure that you fully understand what the word of God is saying. Not only do you have to do that, but you have to intently study, break this thing down, understand fully what you believe, because it's oftentimes that you're going to you're going to run into these preachers and a lot of your favorite preachers do this. You're going to run into preachers who will give you the truth, but then they'll slide in the lie and you won't even realize it because you're so bought into the character. You're so bought into the charisma. You're so bought into what they've said that you, you, you've you've let down your guard and you bought into the lie. And now you're feeding in and you're and whatever you say and do, you're saying and doing based off of what you were taught. Not what you learned on your own. The scriptures are clear. And even if you look into, and even if you, you invest, buying a study Bible is an investment. If you invest into a study Bible, it will benefit you greatly because you will be able to see exactly what these preachers are preaching. <laughs> Period. I'm a preacher myself. So I let you measure everything I'm saying up to the word of God. That's all I'll say. One of my favorite things that preachers who follow this method, uh, the, tr the two truths and a lie method, uh, one of my favorite things that preachers do is that they will sound very educated. They will sound very stoic. They will present big words and even throw in Greek and all these different languages because that is to really, you know, break through your, your mental barrier of saying, okay, okay, I can really trust I'm listening. Okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're bringing all that stuff in. And like once you get to that level, you're like, man, this guy is good, man. He knows what they're saying. This person, they know what they're saying. I, I can trust what they're saying when they give you that lie on the silver platter. You've ate, you've eaten it. Like Satan is a masterful deceiver. He is a masterful deceiver. He knows exactly what to say, what to do, and how to manipulate you in a way so that when you're buying into what these preachers are saying or you buying into what these people are saying, you're able to receive it in a way to like, you're like, man, this, this is really good. This is good stuff. And you're agreeing and you're saying, yes, amen, preach. <laughs> but, you know, Satan is a masterful deceiver in that way to where you don't even realize that you bought into the lie until you really bought into the lie. And, and then when you go and try to talk to other people about what you've learned, people who really know the word. They break it down and they challenge you on what you learn only because they know the truth. Like they know what, you know, you know, the word of God. Satan will introduce things in a way that will leave you questioning the very thing that you disagreed with. You can initially disagree with something. You can initially disagree with it. But because Satan is so masterful in his deception, he knows how to slide that thing in so that you agree with it. And you only realize that you agree with something that you're actually against in the word, of, you know, as a Christian who lives up to the word of God. And so the problem that I have with Creflo's message is that 
he really massaged his audience this way. Um, he massaged them and he got them riled up. He got them going and and he and and I was with them. Like I told you, I agreed with majority of his message. You know, I agreed with majority of the message. I thought it was a great message until he got to that part where he based his entire message on Romans chapter six, verse 14 as the basis as to why Christians no longer have the tithe. And so I won't debate whether he truly had a repentant heart um, of this or um, or whether he um, is truly trying to turn from his way. I don't I'm not getting into that stuff. That's between him and God. Um, but it sounds like from the message that he realized the error in his ways and he's truly trying to correct the error. Um, the only thing is, I don't think that um, it's wise to try to correct the error if you're correcting it off of your own personal kind of convictions that have not that you have not kind of measured up to the word of God. You know, it's OK to, you know, to feel convicted about things that you've done wrong. But you also want to, you know, kind of judge those convictions with the convictions of the word of God um, and make sure that you're lining up to that standard because you don't want to just say, oh, I feel bad about this. But it's actually something that uh, or, or you don't want to say that, I, oh, man, I feel bad about this. But it goes against, you know, the word of God, you know, God would never give you something and or tell you to do something that's in his word that will go against his true very nature to make you feel convicted of it. He will never do that. He will only make you feel convicted if you're in the wrong and you're not living up to the to the standard. So what really, like I said, what really grabbed my attention uh, was the fact that he used Romans chapter six. Because Romans chapter 6 is basically a continuation of Romans chapter 5, newsflash, <clears throat> where the author of Romans is telling the Romans, he's telling people, he's telling them that there is peace with God through faith and laying down the foundation and understanding of the difference between Adam and Jesus. Okay, the author is showing us how with Adam, Adam introduced sin and death through his disobedience and deception and how that death, disobedience, and deception and sin has spread throughout mankind because God gave him the charge, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, and that is one way that sin spread, okay? The propitiation of sins has given us the free gift of righteousness through grace given by God. That is the new covenant aspect. One man's trespass, who was Adam, led to the condemnation of mankind for sin. One act of righteousness leads to justification for life for all men. That one man's act is Jesus. For as one man's disobedience, Adam, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. I'm reading the Bible, y'all. The law came in to increase the trespass but where sin increased, grace abounded. All the more so that as sin is reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness leading to eternal life. What Tertius wrote on behalf of Paul, Paul is the initial author, but Tertius wrote what Paul was saying. It was common in that day to have scribes. Uh, the people, you know, you would say something and the person would interpret it and they would write it down. All that stuff. It was common in that day. Uh, what Tertius wrote on Paul's behalf is that the law was given to us in response to sin to keep us in line. OK, I'm reading this because of the sin. We needed redemption and the law wasn't strong enough to keep us from sin. OK, the law was never the answer, but it was a placeholder for the true redemption of sin, which is in Christ Jesus. Bam. That's all it is about. Grace is given to us through Jesus' acts and works on the cross. Jesus made his stance clear in Matthew 5 and 17, where he says that I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. By fulfilling it, Jesus had to live a life in full obedience to the law, something that us humans could never live up to. We could never measure up to that standard of the Old Testament. If we did, we wouldn't need to offer sacrifice. We wouldn't need to offer all of these different things that they were offering at that time. But because of the fact that Jesus stepped in in our place, 
and, and, and was that redemption of our sins or the redeemer of our sins, we no longer have to do that. Jesus is the only person to ever live a perfect and sinless life, period. He's the only person who ever lived a perfect life. His sacrifice, his life was necessary for salvation. The Pharisees and the scribes. Now, I'm kind of getting into New Testament stuff. The Pharisees and the scribes, they believed that by adhering to the law, the Old Testament law, that this was the very means for salvation. Meaning that they didn't have to dot every I or cross every T. But not even the Pharisees and the scribes could live up to the full measure of the law. Jesus points this out. He pulls this out um, in Matthew 23. And it's funny because when, I'm, when I make the status about tithing earlier, uh, I wanted to really get people to, you know, kind of encourage each other why we tithe. Um, and to not use Ma Malachi chapter 3 because, like I said... You know, we take Malachi chapter three out of context and we continue, you know, we say, well, we don't want to be cursing. It. It's, it's deeper than that. So and this guy, he pulled out Matthew 23 and 23 and said, you know, this is what tithing is all about. OK, let's break down Matthew 23. Matthew 23, Jesus calls out, he rebukes the Pharisees and the scribes. Why? Because their inability to hold themselves accountable for the law. Now, they had no problem with holding the law to people and holding them accountable for it. But because of the fact that they could not live up to the measure or to the standards of the law, Jesus rebukes them openly. He rebukes them for it. One of the things he said before going into the seven woes is this. In verse three, he instructs the crowd and the disciples to do whatever the, 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 the Pharisees and the scribes tell them to do. He says, do what they tell you to do. And he also says they sit in the seat of Moses, meaning that I want you to respect their authority, respect, respect their title, respect who they are. Jesus respected them, even though he called them dogs and he openly rebuked them. And all that. He still respected their authority because they were, the, they were the, the religious authority at that time. So he said, respect their authority. Listen to what they say. Do listen to what they uh, listen to what they say. Do what they tell you to do. But he, he, he adds this caveat. He says, but don't do what they do because they don't practice what they teach. OK, he tells them to do what they say, but not to do what they do, meaning hear the word. But don't do what they're doing. Hear the word and do what the word is telling you to do. Hear the law. Do what the law is telling you to do. But don't do and follow what the Pharisees and the scribes are doing because they're not living up to the standard. OK, this has nothing to do with abolishing the law. This has nothing to do with abolishing or getting rid of the law. Jesus tells them to do exactly what the law says, but he tells them not to follow what the Pharisees are doing because they're not able to live up to the standard, even though they're supposed to, period. Jesus knows that the Pharisees and the scribes are unable to live up to the standard because one thing that the Bible makes clear, Jesus is able to interpret the hearts of man. The Bible is clear on that. He says, man, look on the outer appearance, but God looks at the heart. Jesus knows how to look at your heart and tell whether or not your motives are true, whether or not you're really living up to something. And so that's what we see here. Jesus, he's telling them, hey, I know that you're not living up to the standard because I see y'all, but, but he, you know, he's saying, you know, I see you. I know what you do. Like you're not living up to the standard, but you are holding these people accountable to the standard. So when Jesus said that he is fulfilling the law, he's not saying to replace the standard by doing whatever, but he's saying that we don't need to rely on the law as the standard of measurement for salvation. That's key. I want you to catch that. We don't have to rely on the law for the standard of measurement for salvation. Jesus is the standard. And because he is the standard, his message of righteousness falls under the law of grace, meaning that he is the only one who is able to present us faultless before his very throne. That's scripture. That's Bible. I'm telling you, he is the one who is able to keep us from falling. That's the verse before that one. And he is the one who is able to keep us out of hell because of the redemptive work that he did on the cross. All you have to do is have faith and trust in Jesus. All of these works, all of these things, they are not necessary. But one thing that Jesus was clear on is that we follow the law. We know what the law is because we understand that the law shows us or tells us what is sin. Our sin is what keep us bound to the law. The law is in place so that we can understand what we cannot do. But God knows that we can never live up or we can never really measure up to the law or to the standard of the law. So he sent Jesus to live up to the standard on our behalf. How does all of this fit with tithing?
In Matthew 23, 23, the Pharisees and scribes, they proudly paid their tithe, um, but they paid a worthless tithe. I'm going to read it real, for you real quick. Got my trusty study Bible. Matthew 23 and 23 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay a tenth of mint, deal, and cumin, but or and yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things should not be done without neglecting the others. Okay? The scribes proudly paid their tithe, but they paid a worthless tithe. And they paid a worthless tithe because they tithe out of their abundance, not out of their heart. Again, this goes back to what I said earlier. When God looks at the heart, he knows exactly what your true motives are. He knows what you do and what you're not doing. If you're not able to live up to the measure, he knows that. Okay, he knows all. When you tithe out of your abundance, it means that what you're giving to God, you're giving to God because you now have the ability to do so. And when you had the chance, when you have the chance to honor God or reverence God, you you decided to just give God what you wanted because you wanted to check that off the box list. Like, okay, let me pay my tithes. Okay, let me see what I got left. Let me here you go. I'm gonna pay that off. No, the the Pharisees and the scribes they gave uh, what is it, what is that? Cumin, mint, deal. They gave little things to God, but they had more to give. The thing is, God is not looking at the amount more so that he is looking at the obedience. You feel you get what I'm saying? What people tend to realize or what people tend to think is that with tithing, tithing is all about just living up to that 10%, getting to that 10% and that's all I'm going to give God and that's it. But tithing is much deeper than that. It's much deeper than that because in Malachi chapters one through three, God uses his prophet Malachi to first rebuke the priests. Then he rebuked everyone else. He rebuked the priests because they were not living up to the standard of God. They were tithing. They were giving. But what they were give, giving was worthless. OK, and because what they were giving was worthless, God told Malachi to rebuke or go to challenge them and tell them that they're, they have a worthless gift. They're giving worthless gifts to God. And it shows just how much they actually reverence God through the lack of giving. It's not as he didn't rebuke them because they were giving. Let's get this clear. And this is clear in Matthew 23 and 23. Jesus never rebukes the Pharisees and the scribes because of their giving. He rebukes them. A similar to how God sent Malachi to rebuke the priests in uh, Malachi chapters one and two. He rebukes the priests because they weren't living up to the standard. They weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And not only were they not living up to the standard, the Pharisees and the scribes were a little bit different than the priests in that day because the Pharisees and the scribes actually held people accountable to their things. But the priests in the Old Testament in Malachi, they didn't. They actually taught a wrong theology. And because of this, it trickled down to the people and the people adopted this wrong theology. It caused them to be cursed. They weren't cursed because of the fact that they did not give a tithe. No, they were giving tithes. The problem is they were giving worthless tithe and this worthless tithe that they were giving caused them to be cursed because they were not giving out of reverence. They were not giving out of honor to God. They were just giving to check it off the box or they were giving and it showed that they didn't really care too much about God. Are you giving in that manner? Because that's what Malachi chapter three is all about. It's not about, um, you know, if you don't pay your tithe, then you're going to be cursed. No, the curse was there because they did not give what was due or what was worth to God. It had nothing to do with them not giving. They were giving. They were just giving something that did not reflect how much they love and reverence God, period. And, 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 and all God required was 10% of the best things you got. He didn't want the full 90. He just wanted 10% of the best things that you got. And, and this is the challenge that Malachi made in chapter three. He said that when you tithe, when you do right, he challenged him to tithe and do right. He said, when you do right, then God will pour out blessings upon you because you did what was right and you corrected your ways and you did what was right. When you correct your ways and when you do what's right, God will then reverse the curse, but he will bless you. The Bible said in Malachi 3 that 
that God said, I will pour out blessings that you won't have room enough to, to, to store it. You know, that's the type of blessings that God was able to do only because of how the people responded to him when he challenged them to tithe, tithe correctly. You know, give a, a gift that's honorable to God. It had nothing to do, as I said earlier, it had nothing to do with not tithing and being cursed because of that. It's all about your reverence, your honor, how much you love God. You know, do you love God enough to where you're honoring him with your gifts? You're honoring him with what he has given you, the provision, the job that he has given you. Uh, one thing that this guy, he posted on my status was a, a, a meme. And I thought that the meme was hilarious um, and incorrect because, you know, it said this is what the type should be. We should be giving fruits and vegetables and, and all this to God, not not the money that's in the collection plate. It was, it was, it was so wrong because we're in a day and age where. We get fruit, vegetables, and all this stuff. Yes, that's so wonderful. But what the tithe really is all about, if we make it into a practical terms, you know, money, <laughs> money rules everything. Money is, is honestly, uh, can be an idol or a God um, when you have too much of it and you don't know how to use it properly. But money is the most valuable thing on this earth. And if there's a lot of value and if there's a lot of weight in money and, and what you do with your money, what you do with what God is giving you, you, you show your honor and your reverence to God by saying, OK, God, I thank you for blessing me with this job. I thank you for blessing me with this house. I thank you for blessing me with all these things um, because I'm able to do all these things because of what you bless me. And because this, you know, you've only asked for 10 percent. God, I'm going to give you this 10 percent. But if God challenged me to give more or if I feel in my heart to give more because I want to show just how much more I love God, you know, God is not going to sit there and be like, oh, well, I don't want your tired because you're giving me 11 or 12 percent. No. And, and honestly, you know, God is not sitting here, you know, Cheating people because they're saying, oh, well, you didn't give 10 percent or full 10 percent. No, you know, it comes from your heart. How is your heart connected to your gift? If your gift is not connected to your heart and you're just giving because you want to give, then you're just as an error as these people in Matthew 23 and 23, the Pharisees and the scribes. And you're just as an error, an error as the people in Malachi chapter one and three through three, because of the fact that you're giving a worthless gift. You don't just time to check it off your box. You give out of your reverence and out of your heart, out of your out of the abundance of your heart. The mouth speaks out of the abundance of your heart. That's what you give to God. It's deeper than, than it's deeper than that. If you're just tied up on just the basics of what tithing is and giving money, you're, 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 you're way off. You're, you're missing the whole point. It's much deeper than that. It's deeper because it shows just how much you love God in your obedience. And I'll be honest with you, I, I wasn't the perfect tither. I definitely wasn't a perfect tither until like recently. <laughs> and I and it wasn't because um, of anything crazy. It was just mainly because of, you know, I had to um, really get to the place where I wanted to, uh, where I had to realize what I give is a reflection of my heart. Um, and honestly, this is how I started to building up to really becoming a consistent tither. Um, I would pray and ask God all the time, God, how much do you want me to give in, in this offering? How much do you want me to do? Um, and God would place a number in my heart and, I, and he would challenge me to give it because he knew that in my heart, <laughs> I'm like, this is kind of a lot of money, but I would he, he would challenge me to give this and I would give it. I remember um, I prayed, uh, I'm sorry, I remember I preached um, and right before I preached, God told me, he said, I want you to give your entire, the, the all the money you get from preaching, I want you to give that um, in the offering. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> it was like, come on now. Like, you know, I'm not giving them any engagements and stuff to preach. So, but, you know, I trusted God. He said, if you give, he was like, I'll take care of you. He was, he just challenged me to do it. I did it. After I preached that Sunday, the, the following Sunday after I preached, I gave in that offering everything that I had received from that preaching engagement. And it's so amazing because like it, it, it shifted my mind. It shifted my focus because it made me realize that the money that God gives me, it, it's not mine. It's, it's his, you know, he gives us the provision. He gives us these things. 
And how do I, I show how much I love God? Well, I show him that by how much I give. Um, and so, yeah, I get, I started giving my 10%. I started giving my 10% after that. Um, and then even recently, you know, the Lord blessed, has blessed me and blessed my family so much that, you know, I give my 10%, but he's also given me the ability to pay off debts, to do things that I haven't been able to do in a very long time. Why? Because I feel like it's, it's, it's a response to your obedience. It's a response to your heart posture. God said in Malachi 3 that he will bless you and give you blessings that you won't have room enough to, re- to receive or you won't have room enough to store it because of your heart posture to giving, your heart posture towards the tithe. And even in Matthew 23 and 23, where it says that, um, you know, you, when he tells the scribes that you have weight or you have placed more value on the more weightier things like, uh, or you, yeah, you have placed more value on tithing than you have on the weightier things of the law. He's telling them that basically tithing is something that should be very elementary. You should get that immediately. Uh, but most of you probably are like me. You're like, it's like you're struggling with it or you, you struggle with it. And once you become a consistent tither and you see the blessings that you get, nine times out of 10, the blessings that God will give you as a result of tithing is not monetary blessings in, in, you know, immediately. Sometimes it's the fact that he's kept you when, when you left and went out to work. You know, he kept you that entire day, that accident that you saw on the way to work, you know, God put in your heart or in your mind or he put in your, yeah, he put in your heart and your mind to sleep in just a little bit longer. Um, and you was like, man, why am I so tired? You know, I'm struggling to get out of this bed. But that accident that, you know, that happened down the street, you know, if you had left out initially at the right time, that could have been you, you know, there's blessings that you don't even realize that, that God is giving you each and every day when you wake up in the morning that's a blessing when when you have the ability to buy clothes when you have the ability to take care of your family we're in a recession but you have the ability to pay gas <laughs> you have the ability to still put food on your table you have the ability to still do all of these things why because of your heart posture and your posture towards giving and your posture towards being a consistent tither, being a consistent person that is showing God like, you know, what, God, I, I know that times are tight, but I'm still going to trust you with what I have. And I'm going to trust you with it because I know that you can do more with my gifts. You can do more with my tithe than I can with 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 me holding on to it or restricting it from you. Like, God, I, I thank God that I'm able to do that. And I'm in a position to do that because, you know, he has really blessed us in abundance in ways that I can't even, um, I can't even imagine. I can't even really count them all. It's like the song says, you know, one, two, three, four. I can't even count them all. Like there's miracles on miracles, but there's blessings on blessings on blessings that God gives when you are a consistent tither. And being a consistent tither is not saying, oh, I'm just checking it off the box. No, it's being consistent with your honor and reverence to God. I'm not saying all of this to try to, you know, get you to be like, oh, oh man, I'm just trying to, you know, he trying to take my money. No, I don't want your money. <laughs> I don't want your money. But I want you to understand that even God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. And that's what tithing is all about. You showing God where your heart is. You showing God where your true motives and your true reverence, where that goes to, you know, you can start with 10%. I know friends, I know people who have given, you know, 10% and then they bumped it up to 20. They bumped it up to 30. They bumped it up to even more because, you know, they felt that, you know, as they gave to God, God gave them back in return more than what they could, uh, more than they could imagine, more they could allow. And I'll share this one story. Like when I, when I started tithing a while back, <clears throat> nah, like I said, I struggled. <laughs> But one time I remember when I uh, I gave my tithe, um, I had an interview coming up and um, I remember praying to God. I was like, God, if this job is for me, it's for me, you know, and, and I'm, I'm leaving it in your hands. I went to the interview, um, came out of the interview. It was like on a Thursday or on a Friday. Um, I didn't hear anything immediately after. So I was like, OK, I prayed. And I was like, God, I'm, I'm going to give my tithe this Sunday um, because, you know, oftentimes, you know, most people when they do that, I ain't going to go into that. But, you know, I gave my tithe and I said, you know what, God, I'm trusting you with my tithe. Um, I don't have much, but I need this job. I'm trusting you with it. Um, and, you know, because I love you and I know that if this job is for me, then it's for me. If not, then God, I know that you have something in store for me, period. Long story short, you know, that that next week, you know, I received a prophetic word from um, 
a friend of mine at the time. <laughs> so that following week, I, I received a prophetic word that I was going to get that job. And then it just so happened, you know, I got a phone call. It was like, hey, we're offering you the job. Why? Because I reverence God in that moment. Like I kept God first in that. I mean, there's many blessings. There's many, there are many stories that I can tell. I mean, even recently I had a friend of mine who started giving his tithe and he paid his tithe and he said, you know, you know, I started giving my tithes. And once I started giving my tithes, you know, God started doing something. And I, you know, I prayed with him and I prayed for him. He was like, when did you pray? I prayed for him one day around um, close to four o'clock. You know, when I would pick up my kids, I would pick them up between 3.50 and 4 o'clock. So during that 10 minute window, I was praying for my friends and praying for everyone. He was like, when you prayed and I sent off my tithes, he was like, God, I received the email that I didn't have to, you know, he didn't have to really come up with all of the money that he thought that he would needed to come up with to pay off his debt. You know, God had helped him to 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 pay off his debt. But he actually reduced that amount for him. And not only did he help him and come through for him on that, but he also found out that one of his bills had got paid. A lot of things had started happening to him in his life because he he saw the fruit of tithing. And I mean, and to everyone, to each his own, I mean, you can give and, and sometimes things won't happen immediately. And that's perfectly fine. But you're not. I want you. I want you to get this uh, understanding, too. When you give, you're not giving to receive. You're giving out of honor. You're giving out of reverence. When you receive, that's a benefit of just giving. That's a benefit of, of just being saved. That's just a benefit of what God has for you. So get that in mind. Don't give to receive back because that's not what giving is all about. Give out of honor and reverence to God and how you love and trust him with what he has given you.